Hey guys, it's TJ, trying a little bit of a different video format that I've been thinking about for a while here. Um, just to let you know, our regular Let's Play series are probably going to be coming back in the new year, although we do have something a little different lined up for you uh, that'll be out before the end of the year that you might have heard about if, uh, if you've been following me on Twitter. But basically, I'd like to take some time to go through some news that is pertinent to the games we play on this channel and the games that a lot of you guys tend to get excited about. Um, when we have big announcements for these games, I'd like to just kind of break them down, talk about my reactions, and hear what you guys have to say. This was a great day to start because we had both the announcement of Mongolia for Civilization VI Rise and Fall, which, by the way, if you have not seen it yet, I did an interview for PC Gamer with the lead producer of Civilization VI Rise and Fall, and I will include a link to that in the description. It seems pretty cool. Um, Civ VI is a game I definitely kind of bounced off of. I really have I haven't played more than like 30 or so hours of it, whereas Civ V, I think I, it's one of my top 10 most played games on Steam. I have like hundreds of hours in Civ 5, and, uh, but Civ 5 also was a game that didn't really come into its own until the expansion started rolling out, so I'm kind of hoping that, that Rise and Fall will do the same thing for Civ 6. It definitely has some mechanics that I think are very cool and are things that, that I think can improve this, the Civ franchise in a lot of ways. So the Mongol Empire. Um, I'm a big fan of how they are being portrayed in in Civ 6 for a couple of reasons. Uh, by the way, thank you to Captain Lime on Reddit for formatting their bonuses nicely like this, because if you go to the actual blog uh, that Firaxis put up for the uh, for the new Civ, it's very hard to separate the like historical flavor text from the actual bonuses. So their national ability, um, starting a trade route, immediately creates a trading post in the destination, Increasing diplomatic visibility with the owner, Mongolian units gain plus three combat strength against enemies for each level of visibility. Now, this is very cool because this emphasizes that the Mongol Empire was not just this giant swath of wasteland with, you know, nomadic horse archers running around butchering people for the glory of the Khan. No, they were, they actually fostered quite a bit of trade between, uh, you know, the two sides of the Eurasian world zone, which had a tremendous impact on world history. Um, if there's kind of the famous saying that you, you could walk across the entire length of the Mongol Empire at its greatest extent and not be robbed uh, because they kept peace so effectively in the areas they had conquered. I think that was very cool. It also brings in sort of this element of they they get better combat with civilizations they know more about. This was definitely something that the Mongols did in terms of learning about their opponents and how to best beat them. They were very clever in that way. Uh, they get the Keshig as the unique unit, which is, this is like the stock expected Mongol unit. Um... I'm glad they're they're in here because it would be weird if they weren't. Um, it's a it's a ranged cavalry unit that outranges enemy forces, um, shares its movement speed with any unit that's in formation with it, which is also really cool because it means that you can use your cavalry as vehicles to get your other units to different places, which is very Mongol. Um, and of course, they have absurd combat strength even without the added bonuses. Uh, so I think that's going to be cool. It's different from the Scythian horse archer, and it's going to foster, uh, you know, and kind of aggressive hit and run play style, which is perfectly appropriate for the Mongols. And then of course they have a replacement for the stable that gives extra movement to cavalry that are trained there, which again just increases their mobility, allows them to build these sprawling empires and not have to have as many military units to defend it, you know, compared to the amount of territory they get. Genghis Khan's special ability, all cavalry units get plus three combat strength and a chance to capture defeated cavalry. Again, this is very well historically supported. The Mongols uh, populated their armies with a lot of other nomadic kind of uh, Altaic and Turkic tribes that they conquered on their way um, to sort of the the areas of, of civilization that they eventually 
clashed with. Uh, so that's very cool. I, I really like the design of the Civ. It's probably one of the best designed expansion Civs we've seen so far. I've been very critical of the way a lot of Civs are designed in Civ 6. I think if a Civ's bonus can't be explained in two sentences, you should probably throw it out. There are a lot of them that are, are just... They're too complicated, they have too many exceptions and provisos, and I think that the way Civ 5 did it was honestly perfectly fine, where, yeah, some Civs were pigeonholed into a certain victory condition, but that's better than having to remember, like, okay, I have this unique tile improvement that has, like, six different ways it can interact with the stuff around it to generate different resources. It's it's just, it's too much. I like simple, straightforward Civ bonuses like this, like... You know, Rome, Trajan, he gets a free building slot in each new city. That's great. Go look at the, you know, uh, list of bonuses that, like, the Royal Naval Dockyard for England and Civ Six gives you. I'm like, no, that's that's too complicated. You needed to go back to the design drawing board on that one. So in that way, um, Mongolia gets a thumbs up for me. I'm definitely going to be playing as these guys a lot. So on to Total War Warhammer 2 and the Tomb Kings. So the Tomb Kings race pack, uh, $19 US, 10% off if you buy it now. That's pretty pretty steep for, for a DLC that adds one race, but it does seem like we do get a fair bit of content. I do like that they decided not to include a mini campaign and just to spend more time on... Um, implementing them as fully and as richly as possible in the Vortex campaign and the Mortal Empires campaign. Um, I, I think that's a much better use of resources. Uh, so they'll be, they'll be available in both Eye of the Vortex and Mortal Empires. Um, I'll, I'll scroll down to the more detailed instead of coming, going through all these little bullet points. So... In the Eye of the Vortex campaign, they don't seek to influence the Vortex. This is something I was very curious about. Because I've played the Eye of the Vortex campaign like three times through now, and what I was concerned about is if you add too many more races to this campaign, eventually it's going to become too difficult to clamp down on all your other rivals and you know finish the Vortex objectives before they do. So I do like that they're being introduced into the Vortex campaign with a separate objective. I'm still a little bit concerned because it's like, well, okay, they might not be con competing for the Vortex, but I'm still going to have to worry about making sure that they don't get the Books of Nagash before I finish my Vortex objective. Or if I'm playing as the Tomb Kings, I have to make sure nobody finishes the Vortex before I get the Books of Nagash. It's kind of interesting the way the campaign is set up. The more races you add to it, the the more it's going to be not as not as well balanced in terms of how many resources you have to devote to stopping your rivals versus resources you devote to actually pursuing your own victory. So I guess we'll see how that works. Um, each of the books grants a unique campaign vote bonus. That's cool. Um, so they get uh, Canopic Jars as their unique resource. Uh, you know, you got your, your great-great-grandpa's liver preserved in some kind of fluid. And it's, that's, that's always fun. They can use them to unlock techs, which is interesting. I don't think we've had a race so far that has a unique campaign resource that is directly used to unlock I don't know, that's wrong. That's completely wrong. Because wood elves have techs that require amber. Yeah, I'm talking out my ass on that one. Forget I said that. Um, awaken new units, perform rights, so they are getting rights like the other Warhammer 2 races. I really wish they would add rights to the Warhammer 1 races because it seems unfair that they don't get them. Um, that's just my opinion, bro. Mortuary Cult. So they can uh, construct unique and venerable items. I'm assuming these are going to be like weapons and armor and trinkets and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, there we go. Weapons, armor, talismans, enchanted arcane items. They can also resurrect powerful legions of legend, which I'm assuming are going to be like regiments of renown or like the blessed spawnings for lizardmen. Nothing too different. 
Um, now this is pretty cool. Apparently their tech tree is broken up into the dis dynasties of Nekahara. So you're basically going to be uncovering the secrets of all these different ancient dynasties, uh, which will eventually allow you to unlock heroes from that specific dynasty, bring them back to life, which is very cool. Um, right, so we got, yeah, great in in incantation of Petra, Petra, not sure how you pronounce that. Um, you can colonize a city at level 3, similar to what the Skaven can do with food. That is appropriate to me. The Tomb Kings are all about ruins and, you know, making use of ruins, so I like that. Um, you can generate sandstorms across all of your regions, which causes attrition to foreign armies, increases your ambush, success chance, and confers an ability that basically gives a unit hidden or stock in battle. Again, very cool. You're being invaded. You summon the sands to blind your enemies. Very, very thematic, very Tomb Kings. And then they get kind of uh, some more standard-sounding abilities. Legendary Lords. So Cetra was the one we were all pretty sure was, like, that would have been bizarre if if uh, he hadn't been in there. King of all the Tomb Kings. Um, interestingly, they mention he never needs to return to his sarcophagus to rest. They don't really bring up this mechanic again, but it sounds like their other Legendary Lords and Normal Lords might have some kind of a mechanic where they have to be absent from the campaign for a certain amount of time every however many turns to regain their strength, or maybe they start to gain a debuff of some kind. I guess we'll have to see how that works. Sounds interesting. Um, I hope it doesn't wind up like Bretonia, where you'd have a general die and then you'd like lose all your knightly vows, um, and your whole army would be screwed upkeep-wise. So I hope that if they are making this kind of, like, you need to go rest in your sarcophagus mechanic something that's mandatory, I hope they do have a way to make it so that whatever substitute, you know, Tomb King you, you slot in to, uh, to cover for your, your badass general's nap break, you know, it doesn't completely screw over that army. Um, also, interestingly, it seems like most of his bonuses are campaign-geared rather than battle-geared. Uh, growth in public order, reducing construction time. This is a big one, it seems like, with Tomb Kings. Um, there's there's several mentions of reducing construction time, so it seems like they can kind of stack to build up a settlement very quickly. Um, yeah, so he's going to kind of be the administrator, is what it seems like. High Queen Kalida, uh, she reduces all forms of corruption, enjoys... Which, that's actually something that we were we were um, discussing before Tomb Kings were announced. It's like, are they going to have their own form of corruption? Are they going to be uh, an un, like a faction that spreads the uncorrupted um, province modifier or whatever? Which almost makes more sense for them. So it seems like they're not going to have their own form of corruption. And at least one of their lords is going to be geared towards removing corruption. Hopefully their other lords will have some way, like a skill or something, um, or a hero that can reduce corruption. Uh, hefty bonus to ammunition for all ranged units and adds poison attacks, so she's going to be kind of the the KG. Uh, I could see her abilities working really well with that stock ability um, that we gain from uh, the Great Incantation of Kassar. So she'll she'll be kind of a cool skirmish leader, it seems like. The Grand Hierophant, uh, bonus to dynasty research rate, improves casualty replenishment, which I really like. That's always one of my favorite stats for any Total War faction. Uh, recruit a higher number of Lich Priests, Not I'm not as crazy about. I don't tend to use casters a lot in Warhammer 2, just because my play style is more infantry-focused. Um, and then Archon the Black who was kind of discussed uh, as could possibly be like a hybrid vampire Tomb King character. It seems like they didn't quite go that far with it. So he gets a bonus diplomatic relation with vampire factions and his regions don't suffer public order penalties from vampiric corruption. 
We don't know if he actually spreads vampiric corruption or if he has a way to choose to spread vampiric corruption. Um, but he also gets melee attack and defense for heroes and a boost to the uh, winds of magic. So in it'll be interesting to see how he ends up interacting with uh, kind of the intersection of the Tomb Kings and the Vampire Counts. Uh, Tomb Kings are the Lords, Tomb Princes are the Heroes, that's about as expected as possible. We got Lich Priests, Necrotect, again we have uh, another way to, uh, to reduce um, building cost, I think, is these guys. I th I, yeah, reducing building cost. Okay, so the, 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 um, uh, Cetra's ability in reduces construction time. Okay, so these guys reduce the cost. So it's not really stacking, but it's two complementary bonuses. Um, and then their big battle, uh, changes the realm of souls. Um, more warriors fall in battle. You can basically trigger a mass healing wave. Each one becomes more powerful after the final wave. You also gain army ability, allowing you to summon a unit of Ushabti anywhere on the battlefield. So they're kind of a, a um, faction that seems geared towards throwing a lot of cheap skellies into the, into the uh, battle. Throw your skellingtons at the enemies early on. And as they die, they'll, they'll allow you to replenish and make your force stronger. So they're going to be weaker at the beginning of a battle and get stronger as the battle goes on. Similar to Dark Elves with their, uh, you know, the more blood that's spilled, the stronger they get kind of thing. Which is, which is cool. I like, I like that mechanic. So that is uh, Mongolia for Civilization VI and the Tomb Kings for... Total War Warhammer 2. In the future, these videos probably won't be quite as long because we won't be talking about two announcements at once. Uh, but I'm thinking about doing these for things like Paradox Dev Diaries, any kind of like faction reveal for the stuff we cover on this channel. Um, you know, when trailers come out. Maybe not, maybe not trailers specifically, but if the trailer is actually accompanied by solid information... We'll go ahead and, and talk about it that way. I might pull DM in for some of these to get his, his take on it or some of the other order members. So let us know what you think about this format, what you would tweak, and we will see you guys next time.